Bible study on Psalms tonight. Yay! And uh, sometimes we're going to have multiple... <laughs> Sometimes we'll have multiple psalms that we'll get to be going through, and other times it'll be one, and other times we'll break it up differently. But tonight we'll be doing Psalm 1 and Psalm 2. But before we do that, let's pray together. Father, we are here together and unity. Unity in our need of a Savior who is Jesus Christ. The only way, the only truth, and the only life. We are all unified in that same need of a Savior. We're all unified in the same grace that we must have from you in order to be saved. We're all unified in the same truth, your Holy Scripture. And we gather here tonight to study your Scripture together. And we ask that you'll bless our time together, that you'll grow us in our knowledge of Jesus Christ and our knowledge of your Holy Scriptures, that we might better serve you. And that all these things that we learn, Lord, that you'll etch it onto our hearts and onto our minds, and that you'll be able to bring it to our remembrance at the perfect time. And Lord, that you would illuminate things to us tonight so that when we leave here, we are one step closer to you and wiser and filled with more understanding. Again, so that we might serve you well and tell others of our Lord, Savior, and God, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. Psalm, Psalm, Psalm. Before we even read Psalm 1, verse 1, there's a couple questions right at the beginning of your Bible study. And a reminder to people watching online that the handouts that we go through are available to be emailed. So if you are wanting one of those, either the current study that we're going on or any of the past studies that are on our YouTube channel, all you have to do is reach out to us and we'll make sure that you get those. But for tonight, Psalm 1 and Psalm 2, there's a question right off the bat. Who wrote the Psalms? Oh, I'm hearing a couple different answers. God, okay, that's a good answer, right? Because God did, he did breathe out all scripture, right? That's true, 2 Timothy 3.16, it's all breathed out by God. So yes, he is the author, right? He is the author, but he breathed it out and he had human men write it down. So who is the human man or men that he used to write down Psalms? David. David. Solomon. Moses. Solomon. Solomon. Heman? Oh, or somebody's got a commentary. Okay. <laughs> if I probably hear Heman or Ethan, I know somebody's been digging already because that's true. Those are true. Well, you know what? I always thought David wrote them all and then it mm -hmm. that he didn't, and I never looked up to see if he did. Yeah, the most common answer to this question is David, right? Oh, David wrote all the Psalms, right? He did, didn't he? Well, no, no. I mean, you can identify. God as the as a spiritual author, but you can actually identify seven or more composers of human authorship for the Psalms themselves. King David being the greatest, he wrote at least 73 of them. So out of 150 Psalms, he wrote at least 73. And that's one of the big reasons why when you ask the question who wrote the Psalms, David is usually the one that people answer because that's the one we're familiar with. And he is the one who wrote most of them. There's also the sons of Korah who accounted for 10 of the Psalms. And these would be Psalms 84, 85, 87, uh, K-O-R-A-H. They'd also be... Who? Well, these are, we'll get to that. The time range here is a large time range. So the Psalms weren't written within a year or two. It was a large time range. And that kind of comes, when we get to question two here, that'll help us explain how we can have so many different authors of the Psalms. So you have the sons of Korah accounting for 10. Uh, they had several in the, in the 40s. And then they had 84, 85, 87. We also have Asaph. He, continue, he, he added 12. Asaph, A-S-A-P-H. He did Psalm 50, and he did Psalm 73 through uh, 83, 82? 83. 83. This also says, as when I look. Yeah, there's, there's more here. So, Solomon, Psalm 72 and 127. Moses, Psalm 90. 
Heman, Psalm 88. Not he man. I have the power. Not, not him. This is uh, one of the Levites who were assigned by King David to be a minister of music. Remember that for question two. Ethan, Psalm 89. Ethan played the cymbal in King David's court. Remember that for question two. It will come in handy. There are 50 other psalms that are anonymous, some of which Ezra is thought to be the author of, and others were unknown as to who the human author of was. But it's a different answer than what some of us had thought or heard, or maybe we, we knew it was mostly David, and we knew there were others, but we weren't quite sure who. Now, we had talked about the time range. Hey, wasn't Moses dead at the writing of all these psalms? Yeah, of the writing of most of them, yes. But the time range here extends from Moses all the way uh, through 900 years of Jewish history. So you have Moses all the way back in 1400 B.C. and then 900 years through that. So you could say that the Psalms were a collection of writings that God inspired and breathed out and that faithful men wrote down starting with Moses and going for 900 years or thereabouts. Interesting, isn't it? Interesting. Already kind of a, ooh, interesting. Ooh, you tickled my interest. Ooh. I love when I learn something that I didn't know before or it gets my attention, kind of revs my engine a little bit. Hopefully it's doing that for you as well. What about question two? What does the word psalm mean? Song. Song? Yep. Song of what? Song of P-R? Praise. Praise. Yeah. Psalms is songs, and specifically, they're songs of praise, or sometimes the book of Psalms is referred to as the book of praises. You might be interested to know that in the Greek, the verb here for Psalms means pluck, means pluck or twang, (laughs) not like country music twang, but pluck or twanging strings. Uh, musical instruments, worship, praise, in the sense of music, songs, songs of praise. So you could almost look at the book of Psalms as a hymn book of sorts. That's kind of cool. That's kind of cool indeed. A God-authored hymnal. That's kind of cool. You might read them a little differently now. What about the other part of the question there? What's the overarching theme of these scriptures? If you, now you know what the book of Psalms is, you know it's a book of praises, songs of praises to God. And so what do you think? You know that. You know it's had several different authors with the human authors, one spiritual author, God. What's the, what's the overarching theme? You remember some of the, thoughts, the Psalms, no doubt. So as you kind of call to recollection some of the different psalms, what, what are some of the themes? What's the, and is there an overarching theme? Can we, can we give an elevator speech about the theme of psalms? Or, or what are some themes in the psalms that you, that you know? Guidebook. Guidebook. Because it's referencing what God has said, right? And of course, whatever God says or breathes out is guidance for us. It's expression of his will. Absolutely. So it's a guidebook. What else? What? It's a praise book, yeah. So the overarching theme is praise. The overarching theme is guidance. Worship. Worship. Worship, praise, guidance. It's, does, does the book of Psalms look at life and, and sing according to what this is? So let me try and explain it in a better way. There's two ways of looking at life. There's our life that we have right here and now on this horizontal plane. And then there is the way of looking at life where you're looking vertical, right? Does Psalms look at one or the other or both? Both. Absolutely. Psalm, one of the reasons we like the Psalms is because they're so raw, right? They're so real. It's, it's grounded in reality. When, when David is crying out, 
that woe is me, a sinner, against you and you alone have I sinned, O God. We get that. We get that. There, there's, a, there's a horizontal reality there, an everyday reality that he's talking about. Or my soul is heavy. My enemies are many against me, Lord. Right? That, that crying out of pain or suffering or fear or all those different things. Hey, that's a horizontal reality that we all get. Right? We all can understand that. And it's real. It's really real. But there's also, it's not just that, is it? There's quite a bit of looking to God, praising God, not only for his help on this horizontal plane, but praising God for what God does above and what is above and what awaits and what he's promised. Does that make sense? That there's an overarching theme of just the reality of this life and this world and the reality of the world and life to come and the faithfulness of God. I mean, the Psalms brings up everything. It brings up our dependence on God, our sin, God's salvation, God's grace. So it talks about deep spiritual things, but it also talks about just the everyday horizontal struggles as well. Okay, so a good little primer there just to kind of wet the whistle and get us ready. So please join me, verse 1 in Psalm 1. Blessed. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers, but the wicked are not so. They are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the ways of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. What a summary! Huh! If, if we, no, none of us could write a better summary, could we, of, of just sin, the, 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 the result of sinfulness compared to the result of righteousness. None of us could write a better summary than those six verses. Question three. Oh, yeah, absolutely, right? It stands out a little bit better now, too, after we've gone through 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, doesn't it? That, that, and that's part of the whole thing, is that we want God's Word to be doing that, to, to be becoming clearer and clearer so it does become more black and white well, that especially since we went through everything else even though you yeah. said that but just reading it right away yeah right. and it calls your remembrance back to all that text as well and yeah and it and it's supposed to be that way it shouldn't be difficult to tell the person of god from the person of the world right i mean it should be as plain as day i shouldn't the world is so against Christ, so against God, and the Christian is so all about Christ and God and his word, it should be such a stark contrast. So when it's not, there's a problem. If you can't tell that I'm a Christian, there's a problem. If you can't tell that I'm different from the world, there's a problem. So it's good to have those stark contrasts. Uh, question three, what does the man who is blessed what does the man who is blessed avoid according to verse 1? Verse 1 says, Blessed is the man who walks not. not in the counsel of the wicked. He stays away from the counsel of the wicked. What does that mean? I think it means that he doesn't associate himself with continual sinners. Hmm. He doesn't go to Say it again. Right. Yeah, that's a good way, I think, of elaborating what Jill's saying, is that you don't go to the unsaved for advice or counsel or to have your questions answered. You don't, you don't go to the world. You don't use the same resources that the world does. You don't say, uh, Heavenly Father, uh, please bless my wife's and my marriage because we're having some hard times. And as we go to visit Dr. Phil tomorrow for answers, please bless us. You don't do that. You're Christians. You're not going to get a Christian response from Dr. Phil, right? You're going to get Dr. Phil's wisdom, which is the world's wisdom. 
There, there is a stark difference. Don't forget that Jesus said in Matthew that, that you are either for me or against me. There is none of this middle ground stuff where, where people say, well, that person's kind of a Christian. No. You either are all for Christ or you're all for the world. And don't be confused because the world has so many smiling, nice, polite people who are happy to give you advice, who are happy to, to go out of their way to help you and do things for you, but they're still of the world. Again, Christ said, you're either for me or against me. So you're either, you're either doing what Christ says and you're at helping advance his kingdom, or you're not. There's no in-between. There's no, well, it's not Christianity, but it's a high moral human law or code or advice that I'm using. That's trash. It, we have to be centered on the things of Christ. We avoid or stay away from the counsel of the wicked. We stay away from the counsel or advice of the unsaved. We stay away from the counsel or advice of the world. You don't live your life according to the world or to the unsaved. What else does it say? It says, he does not walk in the counsel of wicked, comma, nor stands where? Does not stand in the way of sinners. Does, not, does that mean he doesn't say, halt, sinner, you can't walk in? It doesn't, that's not what that means, right? It means he does not stand with sinners. You don't associate with them. I am the only Christian in the MS-13 uh, Mexican cartel gang. Doesn't make sense, does it? That sounds crazy. I'm a born-again believer, but I'm also a practicing Nazi. That doesn't make sense. You don't stand with sinners. You don't stand in their way. You don't model their behavior. You don't, there's a disconnect there. Remember back in 1st and 2nd and 3rd John, we were talking about the practicing of righteousness compared to the practicing of wickedness? Well, if you're standing with sinners, you are practicing wickedness. A man who is blessed is a man who is of Christ, a man who's been saved, who's been born again, who's going to show the evidence of being born again. And some of that evidence is they're going to stay away from the counsel of the wicked and the unsaved and the world, and they're not going to walk with sinners, they're not going to stand with sinners. Yeah? But we do that every day. Mm. Okay, so. Okay, you know, you're, good. Talking, you're with a group of people. Yes, yes. So no. let's. How do we rash, How do we bring that together? Because right. it's a good point, right? I have to be around sinners every day at my job, right? They come in. I have to deal with them. They leave. You know, most of the people that come through that door, they're sinners and they're wicked. And so, but I have to be around them every day. Does that mean the same thing as standing with sinners? Are we talking about proximity? Or are we talking about lifestyle or habitual practice or our daily walk? Does that help? Because in our everyday, you can't help it. We're, we're light in a dark world. You know, you're, you're salt. You're the only thing that's preserving this world, right? God is using us as salt to preserve this world. And so we're salt, we're light, we're in the world but not of it. We're ambassadors, so when you think of an ambassador, an hey, ambassador's not from here, he's just sent here to represent, right? So you can be around the wicked in the world. We all are, right? Every single day, like Bob said, he's absolutely right. But the difference is we're not standing with them as far as our lifestyle. We might be in the same room. We might work at the same job site. But the way we live our lives will tell the story as to who we stand with. Do we stand with Christ or do we stand with rebellion and sinners? So you can be in the same room as a sinner and not be guilty of standing with sinners. Standing is more about, are you with them? Are you in their camp in what they believe and what they do? Or are you standing in God's camp? Think of it that way. Think of it that way. What else does the man who's blessed avoid? Notice, these are all things that are being avoided. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. What's it mean to scoff? Mock. Mock. Yep, very good word. There's another, another word, less used, starts with a J and ends in ears. Jeers. Jeers. Mocks. Um, to treat with contempt. You can think of 
You know, you ever see like one of those courtroom movies where the guy is standing up and he's mouthing off to the judge and the judge goes, stop that. One more and I'll hold you in contempt. Ah, see, that's what contempt means. It's not a good thing, is it? So he does not sit with scoffers. He does not sit with scoffers. So this is someone who is mocking or is uh, in contempt or, or cont- has contempt for God. The ways of God, the word of God, God himself. The man who is blessed stays away from all those things. Yeah, but they're so much more fun. Those people are so much more fun. They're so cool. You won't care, right? How can I, how can I let that be my decision maker for me? When Christ has given everything for me, right? I mean, that's the way a believer thinks. You're willing to give up everything. You've died to self. Deny yourself. Pick up your cross and follow Christ, right? All right, question four. Instead, the one who is blessed does what? So for the verse one, we were talking about what he doesn't do. Verse two, what does he do? And let's give some practical examples. So he, verse two. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. So he delights in the law of the Lord. When it talks about the law of the Lord, what do you what do you think he's referring to there? The word of God. God. Yeah, scripture. Not just the Ten Commandments, not just Levitical law, not just you know rules for, for living that God has laid out. All of Scripture is that. All of Scripture is the law of God, the Word of God. So the person who is blessed delights in the word of God. That means you you find happiness there. I find that I can find joy there because it's delighting me, right? The first time I ever tried a a cherry icy on a hot summer day, oh, I was delighted by it, all right? I find joy in drinking a, a cherry icy on a hot day. So, so this blessed man, he's blessed because he, he finds delight, not just in anything, but in the law of the Lord. It's a big contrast. Remember, we were just talking about contrast, weren't we? Here's, here's a contrast. Here's what he doesn't do. The man who's blessed, the man who's genuinely saved, does not do the things that verse 1 says. And in contrast, he does what verse 2 says. He loves the law. He loves the word of God. He finds joy in it. And because you find joy in it, and because you love God, you yearn to abide in it. You strive to be obedient in it. You you strive to practice it. There's something else that he does. There's a second thing. On his law, he meditates. Oh, he gets his yoga mat out, crosses his legs, and meditates day and night. Is that what that means? What's it mean to meditate? Now, we know what God's law means, right? It means God's word, all of Scripture. Steve's absolutely right. And so it says, what does this blessed man do? Not only does he love God's word and find joy in it, but he thinks about it. He dwells on it. He dwells on it day and night. He's thinking about God's word and God's way instead of his own way, instead of the scoffer's way or the world's way. What are some practical examples of what that means? If I said to you, uh, give me an example of someone, uh, what someone who loves God's word and finds joy in it. Give me an example of, of someone. Like if, if you said, hey, I saw so-and-so doing this, and it proves to me that they love God's word and find joy in it. Give me an example, a practical example. Studying. 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 You're all doing it right now. <laughs> it's what you're all doing. Look around at each other and say, hey, there you go. I see. Yeah, you study it, which again leads right into the same context as the second part of the verse. They meditate on it. You dwell on it. You th- that means you think about it. If you have a beard, you stroke it as you're thinking about God's word. Hmm. Or if you're my wife, you, you say, I can't wait till he shaves that thing again. And then he can dwell on God's word. Any thoughts about verse 2 there? All right, question 5. What blessings does such a person enjoy according to verse 3? So we know what we've talked about already, right? We talked about the person who doesn't sit in the seat of scoffers, right? They don't follow man's way. 
They don't stand in the way of sinners. They're not counted with the sinners. They love God's word and find joy in it. They dwell on it and think about it and meditate on it day and night, which means often. So what blessings does such a person like that enjoy, according to verse 3? Verse 3 says, such a person is like a tree planted by streams of desert. No, water. How well does a tree do in a desert compared to water? How do, how, the, better, the closer the water source, the better the tree, right? The bigger it grows. They're like a tree planted by water. What feeds a tree? Water. They're always fed. Makes sense, right? When they're always in the word of God, they love it. They're dwelling on it. They're meditating on it. Well, they're constantly being fed, just like a tree next to water. That tree that's planted by streams of water, it's planted. Don't miss that. It's planted. The tree didn't plant itself, did it? A tree can't plant itself. It needs help. You can't save yourself. You need help. I can't save myself. I need help. And the help that we all helpless sinners need is Christ. Yeah, because it's no matter which way you, you build the formula, if you look at these verses as a mathematical equation, no matter which way you build the formula, the love of the Word of God and the dwelling on the Word of God equals these blessings. Growth. Growth. Security. Safety. Feeding. Right? If I'm a tree, one of the biggest concerns I have is I need water. So I'm planted next to streams of water. Hey, that's pretty good. Not only that, it yields something. It yields fruit in season. Living water. The living water. Yeah, Jesus Christ, the living water. So what are some of the blessings? You're, it's a tree planted by water. You're always fed. You're planted, remembering that you can't plant yourself, just like you can't save yourself. You're going to yield fruit. Yeah, you'll grow in righteousness. You'll prosper. When we think of yielding fruit, it makes you think of Galatians 5, doesn't it? The fruit of the Spirit. Joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. You're going to grow in those things because you're genuinely saved. And because you're genuinely saved, you don't do the things that verse 1 does says. You do do the things that verse 2 says. And then you get the blessings that verse 3 says. So easy. So easy. I did hear uh, Tiff said prosper. Yeah, you're going to prosper in all that you do, which means also growing in righteousness, which is what Kathy said. And that, that ties in with yielding fruit and with prospering. There's going to be a spiritual prospering for such a person. It also says, uh, in between where it says, well, let's just read the whole thing. And he is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. If you're being referred to as a tree planted by streams of water that bears good fruit, and it says, your leaf shall not wither, what's that telling you? You shall not die. Die. You shall not die. Spiritually speaking, you shall not die. You won't wither. You won't die. These are the promises that that person enjoys. The person that's being described in verse 1 and in verse 2 enjoys the blessings and promises that are described in verse 3. And lastly, it says, in all he does, he prospers. Yes, yeah, spiritually, in all you do, you prosper. Not the Kenneth <laughs> Thank you for pointing that out. Yes, not the Kenneth Copeland prosperity, not the Benny Hinn prosperity or the Stephen Furtick prosperity or the Joel Osteen prosperity. Not that kind of prosperity. Prospering in the sense that you're growing in Christ-likeness, you're growing in righteousness, and you're going to prosper in the sense that you get eternal life, and you're going to be glorified. Not to mention what you already enjoy, the forgiveness of sins. Jeremiah 17. Jeremiah 17, verses 7 and 8. Notice how similar this sounds. Jeremiah 17, verses 7 and 8. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. He is like a tree planted by, guess what, water, that sends out its roots by the stream 
and does not fear when heat comes. For it le its leaves remain green, and it is not anxious in the year of drought, for it does not cease to bear fruit. This is a similar promise for those who trust in the Lord. The person who's being described in Psalm 1, verses 1 and 2, is a person who is trusting in the Lord, right? So, of course, we'll find other scripture that bears Striking resemblance, giving a similar promise. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. He's like a tree planted by water that sends out its roots by the stream and does not fear when the heat comes. He doesn't get afraid. You know, a, a genuine Christian whose faith is in the Lord doesn't fear when heat comes because God's got this. He's got me in the palm of his hand. I'm exactly where I need to be. He's promised he'll always take care of me. So no matter what happens, I know that he is good and I can trust him. So I don't even fear when the heat comes or when the fire gets close. Does not fear when the heat comes, for his leaves remain green and is not anxious in the year of drought, for it does not cease to bear fruit. Oh yeah, that's, that's what a real believer is like. Question six. Here comes a flip-flop now. In contrast to those who delight in God's law, these first First three verses are talking about people who delight in God and who delight in his word. In contrast to that, what do the wicked enjoy? Which we find in verses 4 and 5. It says this in verses 4 and 5. The wicked are not so. So everything you read in verse 1 and 2 and 3, the wicked do not receive. That's what it means when it says the wicked are not so. The wicked don't get any of that. When it's referring to the wicked, who's that referring to? The un saved. The unsaved are not so. They're not like verse 1. They're not like verse 2. They're not like verse 3. They're not so. But they're like chaff. They're like chaff that the wind drives away. Anybody know what chaff is? I have a, a piece of grain. Yes, it is the covering of the, of the piece of grain, the covering of the seed. How useful is the covering of the seed? When you separate the grain from the covering, how useful is the covering of the grain? Of the grain? Is it useful or is it useless? useless. It's useless. And, and how easily does it blow out of your hand? The grain stays, right? But when a gust of wind comes, it blows all the chaff out of your hand. So the wicked, the unsaved, are not like verses 1, 2, and 3, but they're like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked will what? will not stand in the judgment. What's that mean? Does that mean they won't be judged? No. Can't mean that. We know that that's not true. We know they'll be judged. So what does that mean when it says that they will not stand in the judgment? They won't be, they, God will approve of them and help them them. Okay, and what was it you said? I was just saying maybe they're so ashamed that they won't be able to stand. Oh, well that's an interesting thought. So yeah. So another way of putting it to maybe understand it more accurately would be that they won't be able to stand on the day of judgment. In other words, when they stand before God at the day of judgment, they will not be able to remain standing. They, they will fall. They will fall in the sense that they will, they will fall into God's judgment. Believers will be able to stand, but not because of what we've done, but because of our faith in what Christ has done. So when we say, who can stand God's judgment? Well, nobody can stand God's judgment unless God has made peace with you through Christ. So they won't be able to stand the judgment of Christ. In other words, they're going to fall at the judgment. Not stand, not, not, not win, but fall, lose. The wicked are not so. They're like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment. Who can stand in, in the judgment of the Lord? Nobody. Nobody but those that God has made right with himself through Christ. It also says right after that, it's something else that the wicked get. They're not able to be in the congregation of the righteous. When God scrutinizes their life, he sees that there has been no payment for their sin. These people are still under the condemnation of death for sin. Not just physical death, but eternal 
everlasting death in the lake of fire. So when God looks at them, he says, well, you can't stand. Only those who are covered in the blood of Christ stand. So instead, you fall. You fall to the lake of fire. You can't join the congregation of the righteous because only those who have been saved by faith in Christ can do that. So there will be no sinners in the congregation of the righteous. No sinners in heaven. No sinners in the new heaven, the new earth, the new Jerusalem. These are all the things that, that the wicked enjoy. Does this sound like something that's enjoyable? What a contrast again. The righteous, who are only righteous by God's grace and faith in Christ, enjoy verse 1, verse 2, and the blessings described in verse 3. The wicked, however, well, they don't really enjoy anything. They are like chaff. They will not be able to stand on the day of judgment. They will fall because of their sin that has not been paid for. They'll have to pay for it because sin must be paid. Sin, mu sin must be paid. All sin leads to death. So if you've sinned, you must pay a penalty of death unless you've got someone who will pay it for you, who's Christ. That's it. So God either, you either have Christ who has paid your payment, canceled your debt of sin, or you don't, and that payment falls on your shoulders. That's what's being described here. And just a reaffirmation here that there will be no sinners in the congregation of the righteous. Question seven. What's it mean in verse six? That the Lord knows the way of the righteous. It says, for the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Let's take the first part first. What does it mean that the Lord knows the ways of the righteous? Are you surprised to read that? Are you surprised to know that God knows the ways of the righteous? He knows everything. He knows everything. He's omnipotent. He's omnipresent. And he's omniscient. He's all-powerful. He's everywhere. And he's all-knowing. So yeah, it certainly does not surprise us that our sovereign God, who is all-powerful, is also all-knowing. No surprise there. But it does come with a little bit of a nugget for us there that he knows the way of the righteous. There's meant to be conveyed a certain amount of intimacy there. That he knows. He knows you. He, he knows those who are his. He is intimately involved and aware of your life. That's reassuring, isn't it? It's very reassuring. When you know that God has saved you and you know that God is sanctifying you, you know that he's paid the price and that you are now justified because of what Christ has done for you and your faith in that. And then you know that when that happens, that, well, God's going to sanctify me. He's going to set me apart for himself. And he's going to start making me more like Christ and less like myself. And I know that ultimately he's going to finish that work and glorify me. Right? Philippians 1.6, the good work he began in me, he'll be faithful to complete in Christ Jesus. Yeah. So you know all that. And so you have a, a certain assurance and a certain confidence that, hey, this is great. God not only knows how to make me righteous, but he knows all those that he is making righteous and takes a personal, intimate uh, account and is aware and intimately in my life. That's great. When you're a believer, this is encouraging, right? Hey, that's great that God's right in there and he knows everything about me. Ooh, he knows everything about me. <laughs> but yet he has still forgiven me and shown me grace and mercy. Now think of it from the other perspective. Here's that contra contrast again. The Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. God knows the way of the wicked too, doesn't he? Again, that knowledge does not surprise us. He knows what the wicked people do. He knows all their sinful deeds. He knows all that. And he knows that the wicked will perish. What's it mean that the wicked will perish? Go to hell. Go to hell. Everlasting death for believers, ever, or excuse me, everlasting life for believers, or everlasting death for the wicked. The only difference between the wicked and the righteous is Christ. That's it. It's the only difference. It's the only difference. So you have two different pathways. One leads to everlasting life, and the other one leads to everlasting death. One goes through Christ. One goes through anything but Christ. 
The way of the wicked will perish. That also tells us kind of hints to the future, right? There'll be a day when the wicked will be no more among us. What a glorious day. No more sin. No more pedophilia. No more abortion. No more racism. No more talk about masks and sickness and illness. All the things that sin has brought upon us. What a glorious day to know that those that sin and the wickedness that sin breeds will be gone from us. One day the wicked will perish. Any thoughts about the first psalm? We're just getting started. This is the first one. Isn't that good? All that there just in those few verses. Pretty neat. All right, we're doing so good. Why don't we move to Psalm 2? Verse 1, Psalm 2. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord, against his anointed, saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. But he who sits in the heavens laughs and the Lord holds them in derision. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? Question 8. Psalm uh, 1, I left that out. <laughs> it's supposed to say Psalm 1 <laughs> uh, describes two different paths, the righteous and the wicked, right? For individuals. Talks about the individual in Psalm 1. Two pathways, righteousness and wickedness in Psalm 1. But who does Psalm 2 apply to? It's talking about righteousness and wickedness here too. Psalm 1 is referring to individuals. Who do you think Psalm 2 is referring to right off the bat, just reading those first four verses? The wicked. The wicked, but in the, the Psalm 1, the wicked, we're, we're talking about them individually. Here in Psalm 2, you're not wrong. We're still talking about the wicked, but the wicked not necessarily individually, but well, it says people. people. Order. Yeah, what's the first verse say? Why do the what? Nations. Why do the nations rage and the peoples Plot and vain. So yeah, it's the world. Yeah, it's the, it's the nations. It's the peoples. The kings of the earth who have set themselves against God. So Psalm 1 is talking about individuals. Psalm 2 is talking about nations, peoples. Large groups led by kings and by rulers. We do that. We ask that question to kind of set the context in our minds. Question 9, according to verse 1 and 3 in Psalm 2, why do the nations rage and people plot, setting themselves against the Lord and his anointed one? First off, who's the anointed one? Starts with the J and ends. Yes, Jesus. So why do the nations rage, the people plot, setting themselves against the Lord, God the Father, and his anointed one, Jesus Christ, his son? Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves... Well, I, I already gave you a clue right there. I already read it in the very first verse. One of the reasons why the people's rage and the, or the nation's rage and the people plot is because why did the people's plot in? Vain. vain. Vanity. What's another, what's another way of describing vanity? Self-love. Ooh, I love myself. Have you seen me lately? I love me. You know, the, the old un unholy trinity, me, myself, and I. So one of the reasons why the nations rage and the people's plot, pushing themselves against the Lord and his anointing one is because of our vanity, because of our self-love. I want to do it my way. I love myself so much that I love myself even more than God, even more than his son, his anointed one, the Messiah. Vanity. Pride. They also have another reason why they are setting themselves against the Lord and his anointed one. It's in verse 3. It says, let us burst our bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. Which means what? What is it they're desiring to do? They're saying... We want to be against you, Lord. We want to be against you, Christ. We're going to stand against you because we love ourselves so much and because you have put us into bondage. 
You have put us into uh, slavery to you. We're not your slaves, God. We're not in bondage to you. We're going to burst our bonds apart. We're going to stand against you, God, and these perceived bonds that we have, this perceived slavery that we're under, we're going to burst that apart. We're going to cast away these cords which you have in, we, in servitude. We've been tied up with these cords to you, God. We're going to burst those apart and tear them off. They, they are assuming and thinking that that what God has ordained, what God has decreed, what God has declared, what God has commanded is not for our good and not out of love, but because, well, he just wants us in bondage. I can't stand that. They don't understand, do they? Do you think God is a God of bondage? God of cruelty, slavery in this sense? Have you ever felt that God is holding you down and holding you back? And he, oh, if you could just break free of God's unloving bonds, that man, sky is the limit. That's what these people think. We know better, don't we? That God's love, God's commands, God's decrees, all those things are done out of L-O-V-E, love. When a parent tells a child, you come back at 10 o'clock, or a parent tells a child, you are not going to school dressed that way. Is it because they're a cruel dictator? Or is it because they love that child? They're trying to spare that child pain or hardship or show and train them in the way they should go. They're trying to help them because they love them. So they institute rules or regulations or they hold them accountable, not out of dictatorship, but out of love. Good parents do that. Good parents do that. Some kids don't realize that their parents' motives are good and are out of love. They just think the parent is being overbearing. And boy, when I'm 18, I'm going to break free of those fetters and I will cut the cords of bondage. Have you heard one of your teenagers say that to you? I'm going to cut the cords of bondage, mom. As soon as I'm 18, I'm out of here. I'm out. Then I'll finally have freedom. You don't love me. I mean, this is no doubt sounds very similar. And at 25, they're back. <laughs> at 25, they're back and in your basement, yes. <laughs> yeah, God loves the bonds and the bands that God ties us to him with are fetters of love. It's fetters of love, a cord of kindness. There's actually uh, Hosea 11. Don't get to quote Hosea too often. Hosea 11, verse 4. This is God speaking. I led them with cords of kindness. Hosea 11, 4. I led them with cords of kindness, with bands of love. And I became to them as one as eases the yoke on their jaws, and I bent down to them and feed them. Does that sound like a horrible thing? Or does that sound like somebody who cares, who's tenderly watching over, meeting the needs? That's our God. That's our God. Any thoughts or questions about that? As to why the nations rage and the people plot? We could go on and on and give lots more examples, but in context to the verses, these are the reasons that are given in the verses why the people rage and plot and shake their fist at a holy, righteous God and his holy son. All right, question 10. What is God's reaction? <laughs> what is God's reaction in verse 4? It says, he who sits in the heavens laughs. laughs. He laughs. Why does he laugh? If, if, if all these people on earth are all gathered together and they're going, why you, God, right? We're coming for you, buddy. You better watch it. God's word is eternal. God's word is eternal. God, does God have a reason to worry when he's got his own creation shaking their fists at him, calling him every name in the book, saying, we won't serve you, you evil God. We're not going to love you. You don't love us. We're not going to love you. We know how to love ourselves. We know how to lead ourselves better. We, we're going we're gonna to break free of your bondage of slavery, and we're coming for you. Yeah, the eternal, sovereign, all-powerful God, that's no threat to him. He laughs. He laughs. 
It says the Lord holds them in derision. Anybody know what derision means? Mockery. Ridicule. Doesn't take them seriously. No threat at all. Mocks, mocks their foolishness. Mocks their, mocks their whole everything. Now it holds them in contempt. Just like how we talked about contempt in verse 1 this time, or in chapter 1, uh, this time God's holding these people in contempt. Verse 5. Bless you. Verse 5. Then he will speak to them in his wrath, referring to the same people. So he laughs. He holds them in contempt. He mocks them. And then he speaks to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage, and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron, and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. So question 11 asks, what does God pronounce next? He pronounces J-U-D-G. Judgment. He laughs. He mocks. And then he pronounces judgment. And his judgment is perfect. He doesn't judge out of, uh, you know, like if uh, some, some kid comes up to you and he takes a Louisville slugger and he smacks you on the back of the kneecap. Right? And you turn around, you're like, Wah! and you're like, I'm about to pass judgment on you, right? <laughs> That's not going to be a very balanced, uh, you know, uh, calm kind of judgment. It's going to be, no, Nintendo for 17 years, and, you know, we're going to go cut your hair off right now, and you're going to carry this sign for two years, and all you're going to eat is kale the rest of your life, and, you know, this, your, your judgment in that moment is skewed because you're angry, right? So you're not giving a, a well-thought-out, balanced response. God's judgment is not that way. God does not say, what? How dare you? Ha, 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 ha. Burn you with a, our gla- or with a magnifying glass like a little ant that you are. <laughs> yeah, God doesn't do that. God's perfect. God's perfect. He doesn't lose his, his temper like we do. When he passes judgment, it's perfect. Just like he is. So he's saying, um, what's God speaking to, in, or who's God speaking to in verse 5? Those people who have just shook their fists at him, right? He speaks to them in his wrath. His wrath is reserved for those who are against him, not those who are for him. He's going to speak to him in their wrath, in his wrath, and them in his fury, saying, As for me, I've set my king on Zion, my holy hill. Uh, who is God referring to in verse 6? When he says, as for me, I have set my king on Zion. Who's that? Jesus. Jesus. And where is the holy hill? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. So then I will speak to the unsaved, those who have shook my, their fists at me in my wrath, and I will terrify them in my fury, saying, as for me, I am the Lord God. I have set my king, Jesus Christ, in Jerusalem, my holy hill. Interesting that, that this is God's response, right? This is God's response after the people are shaking their fists at him, saying, we're going to break free from your evil bondage. That this is God's response. He laughs, and then he passes judgment. And part of that judgment is the proclamation of his son, Jesus Christ, becoming the king of all kings and being on the throne in Zion, his holy hill. Question 12, who is verse 7 speaking of? It says, I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Who's that? Yes, hard one. Jesus. Jesus. What does God offer to give Jesus in verse 8? I will give you the nations as your heritage, the whole world. The ends of the earth is your possession. I'm going to give everything to you, my son. It will all be yours. You're going to be the king of all creation. What does Jesus do in verse 9? It's the last part of the question. And why? 
Verse 9, it says, Jesus will break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Why? They're wicked. They're wicked. He's going to subdue them. It doesn't say he's going to break them with a feather. He's going to tickle them with a feather. No, he's going to break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. He's going to subjugate. He's going to flex his sovereign muscles. That's reassuring to the saved, isn't it? Hey, you're going to, hey, I want my God to be a powerful God that is not mocked. I want my God to make all things right. I want those who are wicked who do not come to repentance to be judged. I want God to do what's right. I want him to come back. Have you, were you ever a kid in school and the teacher said, pardon me, I need to go to the principal's office for a minute. I'll be right back. And then they leave. And the whole rest of the classroom is going, blah, 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 right? And they're dumping out all the, you know, beakers of all the juice, all the stuff that's in the beakers, and they're throwing stuff. And you're the one good kid, right, who's sitting in the corner. I'm like, boy, mm, mm, mm. How are all of you troublemakers, right? You're doing what's right. They're all picking on you. Come on, come on, Michael, come on. Clapping the, the erasers. You got a big cloud of dust all around, right? Pulling down on the map, letting it go, back up, right? Come on, join in, Mike, you big wimp, you big wuss, why aren't you blowing? And inside, you're secretly saying, please come back soon. <laughs> please hurry in, come back, please. Please come back, I can't wait till you come back, and when you come back, oh, I hope you get them. I hope you get them good, right? Because they poured glue in my hair, they stole my stapler, you know, which would explain a lot of things now. I'm not talking about a real past story. I'm making this up. But you get my point. You want the authority figure to come back and set things straight. Right? Or how about the people who were in the, the, the midst of Minneapolis or Portland when, when all the authority left? What happened? Chaos. Chaos on every level. And the people who were living there, you better believe they were like, please, authority, come back. And please, you know, Make it right. That's what you're begging for. Well, that's what God will do through Jesus Christ on the throne. Verse 10. Now, therefore. So in other words, because of all this, that's what therefore means. Now, therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned. O rulers of the earth, serve the Lord. Serve him with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son lest he be angry and you perish in the way for his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all those who take refuge in him. Question 13. What are verses 10 and 11 calling for? Now therefore, O kings, be wise, be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. What's that a call for? Ro, 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 ro. Repentance. Repentance. Not bad, only one syllable. It's a call for repentance. Mercy. Avoid everything I just said by repenting. Now, therefore, O kings, be wise, be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear. We've read that before, haven't we? Fear of the Lord is the beginning of all wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the fact that God is God and He is holy and righteous and I am not. That terrifies me because I can't get holy and righteous and that's what God says I need to be to be able to be with Him and be made right with Him. I must be holy and righteous as He is. That's terrifying because I'm not. That's why I fear Him. But then I find that he has made a way for me where there was no way. The way is Christ, his son. So in my fear out of God being holy and me not being holy, I come and fall on my knees and cry out to Jesus to save me. To do for me what I could not do for myself. And put my faith in his righteousness and in his holiness and his life lived perfectly for God, not mine. It's not an addition to mine. It's instead of mine. And so then I am now made right with God. I repent and I'm made right with God because of that. And it's all because of fear. 
Do you see now, if fear is the beginning of wisdom, why it's unwise to go to people with this kind of gospel? Jesus loves you, and God loves you, and he just wants you to love him back today. Will you pray this prayer with me? Whoa, we're missing something. We're missing why you need Jesus' love. We're missing why you need to have the gospel and why you need to pray a prayer. You're missing the fear of death, which is the result of sin, which we all have. So even here, you can see these truths pointed out in Scripture. Be wise. Be warned. Fear God. Repent because of that fear and find forgiveness. Rejoice and trembling. Yeah. Question 14, who should kiss the sun and why? What's that another way of saying something? It says, kiss the sun lest he be angry. Who's the sun? Jesus. Kiss Jesus lest he be angry. So does that mean everybody, who, first, who is that referring to? Who needs to kiss Jesus? Mm -hmm. Yep, everything that was, everybody that was being referred to in context before this. Those kings, those nations, those peoples. Repent. Kiss the sun. Now, let's, let's change that. What else could I... If I didn't like the phrase, kiss the sun, what else could I change it to? That means the exact same thing. But to us, we, we read kiss the sun and we think, is that some kind of crazy Led Zeppelin verse? Is that literal? You know, do I need to... Was, is, is that the... Uh, what is that? Mystery date? That old game? You know, do I need to open the door? Oh, it's Jesus. I need to... Give him a sloppy wet kiss, because uh, that's what Psalm 2 tells me to do. What's it mean to kiss the sun? It doesn't mean, come here, Jesus, let me plant one on you. Praise. Praise. What would you say, worship? worship? Worship. I got a great word for you. Pay homage. Huh? Homage. Pay homage. Pay homage to him. Kiss the sun. You know how the Pope goes, hey, come here and kiss my blasphemous ring. You're paying homage to the Pope. Same idea, right? I am, I'm, I'm, saying it's a symbolic act that I am paying homage to Christ. I'm acknowledging him as my Lord, as my Savior. So see how that makes so much more sense? Now therefore, O kings, be wise, be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord God with, and, with fear and rejoice with trembling. Pay homage to Jesus Christ. Give your allegiance to him, lest he be angry and you perish in the way. For his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. And that would be the other part of the question. What, what's it mean to take refuge in Christ? To ask him to S-A-V-E to save you. Yeah, you're taking refuge in him by asking him to save you from this wrath. From his anger. And God is rightfully angry. He's rightfully angry. We have, we have given our allegiance and taken it away from him. We don't give it to him. We have sinned against a holy God. He's rightful, rightfully angry and right to be angry. So here we have a, a warning to not die in your sin, but to repent and pay homage to the Son. Come to him. Ask God to save you. Put your trust in him and avoid all these things. Because God's wrath is quickly kindled, you don't know when, he's, when, you're, when his wrath will be kindled and when your day is your last. Do it now. Repent now. Find all these things now. All right, brothers and sisters in the Lord, let's close in prayer together. Father, it makes me happy. Uh, it makes me happy to be in the presence of other brothers and sisters who love your word who want to meditate on it day and night, and I pray that you will just foster uh, that hunger and that love and that you'll give them joy and peace that passes all understanding through uh, just the, the power and the truth of your word. And one of the things you say in your word is that we can pray to you and we can cast all our anxieties on you because you care. All these things, all these people, we lift up to you and we lift ourselves up to you, Lord, asking your forgiveness of our sins and asking you to remember that we are but dust and thanking you that you have forgiven us through Jesus Christ and called us to your side through him by grace alone, through faith alone, and him alone. We thank you and ask you that you help us be good ambassadors for you until we meet again in Jesus' name. Amen.
Have a good night.